I knew from the beginning that it was just something here, something here. There's something really big here. As a child, I was a painter. So art was something that was inside of me. And growing up in the projects, I just happened to be neighbors with some of the guys, the original members of TMB. And I grew up with these guys, I had to play ball with them. And they were always tagging and doing pieces. So I just, it, it was just a natural thing for me to, you know, to be curious about it. We're playing softball. Um, in, in a park, and this was like 74. Right over my shoulder was a subway L. And I remember this so vividly. Um, they, they say, they call time out. And I'm, you know, okay, so I'm just standing there in the outfield. And my friends are looking over, the, you know, looking at the subway L's and I'm looking up. And it was a mono piece, one of the Fabulous Five. And it was like this massive piece. And that was a trigger. I knew Case before I knew he was, he was a painter. He used to go around the neighborhood riding a 10-speed bike, and he was the only person in my entire life that I saw with one arm that can actually do a wheelie on a 10-speed. He used to do this, and people were like, what the hell? I mean, on a 10-speed bike, he just like pop it and just go. Word, Butch and Butch with the Tiger Skid. Either 79 or 80. Kay said, look, you know, we should do a, we should do a train because Butch just came out of prison. I'm like, let's go, you know, let's, you know, we hook up the paint, we'll get the paint together. And we get to the layup and you see all the police, you know, just on the layup, like, oh. So we went to Esplanade. Now, you know, I go into the tunnel just to make sure everything's cool, everybody's on the station. I go in and I smell paint. And I'm like, hey, someone was in here. So I go back, I said, yo, Case, come on. So I go down with Case, and we're going, we're going. We had just missed Lee. Lee had just finished doing the lead piece with the little kid on the airplane. I mean, he just, I, it had to be like an hour or two. I mean, because I'm like, I smell the, the rust. I'm like, wow, it really stinks. And he's walking in, walking in. I'm like, whoa, someone just painted here. I climb on a train. I'm like, yo, Lee was just here. Star Wars was, was to me um, sort of like underlining a sentence, you know, or the exclamation point at the end of a sentence. This is like, here it is, that type of thing. To me, it's, it's so like biblical. But what I remember about style was, is shy. My daughter was, was watching and not too long ago, that's what's weird about this. And I, and I heard the voice, it just hits you. Like what we gotta do is meet everybody in a home 49th street at the bench. You know, it's, it's a weird thing because you're, you're watching it and so you hear his voice or you see his face and it just brings back a lot of memories. The first time it really hit on me, I was on Grand Central Station. This was uh, 77. And this train rolls in. It was um, the Purple Hazel car. It was a car that they did like with all these purples and pinks. I mean, it was, I thought it was fantastic. And these two women were like, wow, look at this. And I was like, you know, like, what? You know, it just, what? Because, when, I mean, when you're painting the subways, you're painting for your peers. You're not painting for anybody else but for yourselves. But those two women... Triggers, you know, triggers something in me. What studio time has done for us has opened the door and let us really become creative, not stuck. Oh, can we just do our names? You know, because when you got half hour, you just do your name. Because remember, graph in its simplest form was about fame. Like, I got my name up more than you did. You know, I got it all over the place. That's what graph was, plain and simple. Um, we took that and we sort of like, okay, let's see how much we can expand on it. The first thing that I was involved with was um, a show that I helped put together at Fashion Order. And I think that was like the first real big show after the Razor Gallery in 75 that was just focused on graph. I mean, to me, it was like the first sign of how serious, you know, this is. I mean, because we went in, you know, we, we were just paying subways. We didn't think about uh, long-term repercussions. You know, we didn't think about our um, careers. We were just, you know, painters. Yaki Kwamblet was like the, the first guy to come into New York and search, you know, and search us out. He was very serious about it. He, you know, he came and said, look, you know, I want to do an exhibition and I want to do this and I want to buy the artwork from you. So he actually 
put his money where his mouth was. In between that, you had galleries, you know, on the lower side, like, you know, Fun Gallery. You had uh, 51X, you know, that were doing stuff. But someone like Sidney Janis, you know, we talk about Blue Chip Cat, you know, gallery representing, you know, Pollock, you know, Warhol doing this stuff. You know, that was like, shit, you know, this is pretty serious. I was approached by a friend of mine, Eric Clapton, to, to design a, a Fender. So I called up one of his assistants in London and I asked him, look, you know, I want to do this. But I don't want you to tell Eric about it. I want it to be a surprise. Then Fender approached me about doing some. And that's, that's what these are, 50 one-of-a-kinds, and they were bought up before I even started them. I have to do them and ship them out and never see them again. All the guitars, all these uh, actual parts of letters, um, so it sort of really goes back into like, you know, the whole graph and train things. Um, like this part of the letter C, you can see the little line. These things don't have edges. And as I painted it, I had to turn it and turn it and turn it. And as anyone knows, um, spray paint is really, really um, hard to control. One of the master builders at Fender had this idea of doing a, a template of a, of a strat. Fender strats are a huge collectible item. I mean, they go for big money. Picasso, eat your heart out. There you go. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what they're going for. Um, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, the last ones, because you know they they start like with the first ten sold at this price, but the last ones were going between twelve and fifteen thousand. Wow. Yeah. To you? No, <laughs> no, to Fender. You know, to to, uh, to Fender. <laughs> Started out on the ukulele, age of 16, bought his first Mercedes cash money. That's the guitar man. I come from the generation of graffiti writers that were primarily focused on painting steel, painting subway trains. It took me a while to get over that, just painting subway trains. But after a while, anything that was a train will do. We have here a train painted by Smith, train painted by Cycle, New York subways. Then they were got to follow them until they were being buffed at the end of the line. There's a work guy cleaning it off. And that's the status of New York graffiti now. All graffiti writers come in this room, all they see is spray paint. Normal people come in here, all they see is birds. I started painting on subway trains in, in 1980. And there was already two generations of graffiti writers be before me you know, heroes and legends to look up to. And I painted uh, on subway trains until about 1985. I was a young girl in a world of boys, in, in the boys club. I was, uh, in 1980, I was the only female painting. I mean, there had been a lot of females before me in the 1970s, but they'd all stopped by the time I started. And I was a bit more afraid of being caught out there by rival graffiti writers that were looking to steal spray paint, steal your jacket, steal your sneakers, and hey, let's do something to the girl. They're making European paint geared specifically for graffiti writers. It's thicker, the colors are richer, it doesn't drip, it works in all weather. One company alone has like 900 colors. And you know, in American paint, we're talking about a dozen colors. See these, these are top of the line. If you have a lot of work to do and you have to defend yourself in the process, 
this is what you use. I started exhibiting in galleries pretty much at the age of 16 with some of the best graffiti writers out there, including Dondi, Zephyr, Crash, Days, Futura, these guys, they've invited me to be down on their exhibits and I was still a toy. I was still learning how to how to do my name, practicing on the subway trains. And when eventually it became known by my teachers that all of this was true and I was exhibiting at PS1 and New Museum and so on, they all failed me in art out of jealousy. I have some Montana Alien. Beautiful lime green. They haven't made this in America in over 20 years. They've been naming colors in Europe after famous graffiti writers like Sess and Lumen and Seen and Dondi White. I think it's just awesome. Writing graffiti is a kind of activity that a teenager can take up if you want to prove your manhood, and that goes for the girls too. If you have need to prove your machismo, that you're brave and tough and all of that, it builds character. I've had the opportunity to paint some trains over in Europe as well, in Germany and Switzerland. Uh, I was like going on a military maneuver. They had everything together from before even leaving the house to, you know, how they go about and do it. It's like sitting in a room with like four or five guys and they're all pre-shaking their paint before they leave the house. I was on the floor rolling. They put on their ski mask, the way they pack their spray paint in the little boxes of six pack with every can labeled on top what, what color it is so that you're not fiddling in the dark. I didn't know why we were running, why we were hiding, their barking orders in German. We did a couple of whole cars in 20 minutes flat. In 1994, on Christmas Day, Mickey and I went and painted a whole car top to bottom in a layup of a brand new station underneath Central Park. We had a lot of privacy to ourselves, and it was the first whole car by two females. Mickey is one of the most famous and well-respected female graffiti writers from Europe. Most New Yorkers thought that, you know, that was a New Yorker. And then even more shocking, they, they had no idea that Mickey was a girl. We heard a funny situation later on. Some of the transit workers were in a bar talking to an old friend of ours, an old school writer, Sash. And he overheard these guys talking about that they got fired because one of their subway trains got painted on Christmas Day by these two people named Pink and Mickey. The freight yards are a lot like the subway yards used to be in the 1970s. No fences, no security, you can just go there with some friends and have a good time. We get photos back of our work with cornfields and cows and mountains standing by them. Everyone's biggest dream and aspiration is to do a whole car top to bottom. But those freight trains, they're twice as big as subways. Mind you, it takes an incredible amount of work to do a top to bottom whole car. Challenge. But here we go. Beautiful pink smith top to bottom. We are folk artists. We're one of the few arts that was started by American kids, by teenagers. And just because it was started by a youth culture doesn't make it any less valid. And it's going three-dimensional. We have incredible artists like Revs, who works with metal, who just goes places and solders his metal sculptures to, you know, wherever he wants. We have people doing graffiti with tile and posters and stickers and altering street signs to their own, you know, taste. We're altering our environment. Is that what graffiti originally was? Yes. It took all the cultures and made them one. It knocked down the Great Wall, I think it knocked down the, the Iron Curtain, and they were running out of space as fast as the walls.
We're playing with like mad electricity trains, 600 volts. Um, just tons and tons of metal just rolling around and we're writing on it. We, we took this hard form to another level. Lost out. Little by little. Lost out. It was quick and everybody was trying to get like fame so it was like a rush. Alright, here we go. Painting the trains, man, and, and running around and living in New York City in the 70s. It was beautiful. And graffiti changed the whole way of thinking in the whole world. I used to be the president of a group called Wanted from Woody Press, of all the best writers like LSD, Pina, Cheka, Sonny, Chi Chi, I could go on, um, Mocho, Little Flame, fucking Bot 707, Razard, um, <laughs> Purple Haze 168, Dead Leg, I mean, go on. That's the crew. Afro, Lava, Straight Man, Cool Breeze. I stole a Super 8 movie camera to 42nd and I filmed all my friends. Just this trip is major because you have the D train to the four line and that's everything. It covers the whole New York City as far as I'm concerned. You got both lines, you're the king. The D and the floor is the only thing you need to hit. And you, you take over the whole city. This is a jungle. We're living in a jungle, that's why the greens. If you look here, he's telling you stop bitching, well, get out of here. Do your shit, do what you gotta do to get out of here. This is your hell. The only way out of here is over the wall. There's bullet holes in that wall, and they reach it for the stars. If you look over the wall, you see the stars. The free to write, right? My name is Brian, I write be easy on the wall. My name is Damien, I write hey one. My name's Raheem and I write habits. I strategically put my name on every corner, like everybody in Riverdale, Brooklyn, Bronx. But I would have the neighborhood people help me spray paint. And so at the same time, they would feel it's theirs. It's theirs. It belongs to them. It belongs to the neighborhood we're in. They painted this wall with me right here. First time they ever did a mural in their life. You get past this jungle, past the lines, past the hell, and you take your juice and you make it, you, 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 then you find your dream, and you never forget it. It ain't for me, it's for them. I have to do it for the people too, until I feel like everything's all right, and I'm satisfied with the way it looks, and it seems like I never get satisfied. I wrote this list about 1992, and half of them were alive and half of them are dead. Now we're on to two thirds of dead. So if your name is up there. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be one of the guys dead. But you know, the whole idea is to live. I keep living and living, I'm gonna keep doing it. Till I die, and if I die, and I mean nothing comes from this, but my heart, I gave what I got, I did what I did. I did what I'm supposed to do. That's my talent, I gave it to the world. If you look above me, it says the Bronx. And on the Bronx, if you notice the last part of it, it's got an X, because in the streets, there's no rated G, P, R. It's rated X. You don't know what the fuck you're gonna see next, and there's no, you can't put no freaking rating on the real world, because you don't know what's gonna happen, and they don't know how to edit that shit. So this is X, it's straight up X. Love you, wild style. This is Yang and this is Yang. That's the Grim Reap. I put him 15 minutes faster and Yang. And at the same time, you try to handcuff me, I could always unhook the, the straps and I'm loose. Wild Style. It's only one Wild Style, baby. Tracy Wild Style. Only one Wild Style. I first got to Brazil about five years ago. I kind of knew that there was a lot of writing there. They were influenced by graffiti and by the hip-hop culture coming out of New York. 
And uh, I had like an opportunity to go and to collaborate with Ogemios in Sao Paulo and to create some walls with them. So I got down there, met a lot of people, and I was just pretty much amazed by like the whole culture there. It reminded me of um, New York, like maybe in the early 80s, like before there was a lot of money pumped into hip hop and, you know, gold records and a lot of the material rewards of all of that. You know, you more or less just had this kind of communal spirit. I've also done like workshops in the favelas in Rio, um, where I come in and um, I work with kids there. The community itself gets no assistance from the government at all. The government's attitude is, well, they don't pay taxes, so why should we help them? So they have to help themselves if they want to get anything done. So I've come in more or less as a guest, free of charge to to try to work with kids to create their own murals, you know, and, um, you know, not to sound funny or anything, but like I could tell that just from my being there, it's like made a difference in their lives that like somebody cares about what's going on in there. This is one of the first paintings I did in the Brazil series. I wanted to kind of break away from the picture postcard view that everybody has of Corcovado and the beach and all that. And this guy is kind of a young kid that's caught up in the drug trade. She is the opposite. She is like another teenager, but more indigenous. Someone from like the Amazon or those areas, more the interior. So you have two people from the same country leading completely different lives, lifestyles and lives. A lot of the things that I paint are coming from personal experiences or personal ob observances. I did a series of paintings that were about elevated stations here in New York. That was all based upon layups where we used to go paint, like 225th Street or Zariga Avenue. You know, I used to see a lot of crazy things from painting trains or whatever in the middle of the night. I think that series kind of captures a side of New York that doesn't exist anymore or is disappearing. All that, to me, has like a connection to the series that I'm working on now about Rio and about Brazil, because all I'm trying to do is capture like a slice of life there. You know, I feel like I can make a big statement by approaching it in a small way.